Time Warner Cable is pleased to be an underwriting sponsor for Carolina Week. Coming up, hacking. A computer on campus is attacked 21 times per minute on campus. We'll have that story. Plus, students dodging cars at this crosswalk may get some relief, but they'll be paying for it. In sports, the Tar Heels are bowl eligible, but should they go? And we're digging up the past, dating all the way back to the start of the university. What will it tell us? Carolina Week starts right now. From the James F. Goodman Studio in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, connecting campus and community, this is Carolina Week. 11 million. That's how many times a year experts say someone tries to hack a computer at UNC. Good evening. I'm Kathleen Whitty. And I'm Preston Jones. The university spends thousands of dollars each year to defend computers on campus. Amy Whitaker reports on those efforts and what you can do to protect yourself. UNC senior Hannah Sacco says she wouldn't make it through the day without her email. So this news was devastating. And I got a text from my mom and it was like, your Gmail got hacked, you need to change it. Anxiety hit quickly. I was worried that I might have, they might have access on my bank statements, my online bank of Wachovia and Bank of America, and then Facebook, and who knows what they could have done. Turns out, they wiped my entire inbox, and then they forwarded all of my incoming mail to hcsacco at ymail.com. What's even scarier? Her hacker sent emails to her friends and family saying, It was, um, dear, like, hi, family and friends. Like, I'm currently traveling in Spain, I'm in Madrid, and I was robbed at gunpoint and they stole my wallet, and so if you could please send me money, I would really appreciate it. The hacker signed the emails HB. My family, they called me HB for Hannah Banana, so it was really great. That's how I signed my emails to my family, so they must have like gone through my emails and found out that's how I signed some of my emails. UNC Information Security Officer Stan Waddell says this is nothing out of the ordinary. We turn away a huge number of attacks and unwanted communication sessions uh, on a weekly basis. And the numbers are shocking. Waddell told me the university detects about 30,000 hacking attempts on campus every day. If you do the math, that's about 21 per minute. And even more go undetected. And a lot of those attacks come from the internet, not individuals themselves. So what causes most of the problems? Malware. Any software that's designed to make a computer do something that the user or the owner of the computer didn't intend for it to do. And you download malware without even knowing it. Websites on the internet have been laced and seeded with malware. And you can't look at a website and say, hey, that, that website's bad, it's got malware on it. So what can you do to avoid being hacked or coming in contact with malware? Keep your system updated, make strong passwords, and change them often. Sacco says it's a lesson learned. Because you don't realize how much information you have in your emails that you just look up randomly, so you type in the search bar and then you can go search through the old ones. So I have nothing from before September. Once malware gets onto a computer, it looks for other computers in the network that are vulnerable to the same type of malware, so the problem spreads. Now, Amy, what exactly is the university doing to protect us? Waddell told me the university has top-notch software to prevent attacks, but it only works 40% of the time. So you mentioned this 40%. What exactly does that 40% mean? Well, 70. 73,000 new pieces of malware are released every day, and the software protects you from less than half of those. So Preston, it's really important for you to change your passwords and update your computer systems frequently. All right, Amy, that's Amy Whitaker live in the studio. Thank you. Now to a follow-up story we first brought you last week. ECU is changing its emergency response plan after the false alarm there. It all started when students reported seeing a man with a rifle on campus. It turned out to be this man with an umbrella. It was this picture that led to three hours of a lockdown. But ECU students who were put on lockdown didn't receive the initial text message alert. The person who was supposed to send the message mistakenly sent it only to faculty and staff, not students. So now the software is being changed so the person sending the message can select all instead of separately selecting faculty, staff, and students as recipients. And a second person will now be reviewing the message to make sure it's correct before it is sent. Jury selection continued today in the trial of Lawrence Alvin Lovett Jr. He's accused of murder in the shooting death of former UNC student body president Eve Carson. The case is being tried in Hillsborough. The jury selection process is expected to continue for most of the week. 
Lawyers in the case say the trial could finish up before Christmas. Just weeks after Chapel Hill received a national award for pedestrian and traffic safety, university officials say they are taking another step to keep you safe while walking on campus. That step is to fix what officials call a dangerous crosswalk, but safety comes with a cost, a big one in this case. Patrick Wright has that story. You can't see them over the hill, and what's worse, they can't always see you. This obviously is a dangerous crosswalk. That's senior Nicholas Sullivan. He's the chair of Student Government's Student Safety and Security Committee. Sullivan's committee helped launch a $19,000 project to remodel this crosswalk across from the Smith Center. A company will repaint the lines, put up new signs, and install solar-powered crossing beacons to make it safer for pedestrians. The problem for some students? They're footing most of the bill. I'm not too happy. $19,000 seems excessive for a crosswalk. Crosswalk's pretty clear and easy to see during the day. Well, Sullivan says the issue isn't what you can see during the day. It's what you can't see at night. It's just rather dangerous at nighttime. The lighting's not that good either. The Safety and Security Committee is working with UNC facilities on the project. The department's landscape architect, Jill Coleman, has helped lead the project, but she declined to an interview on camera. She did say, however, that the department chose the cheapest option, and students should feel good about the decision. Let's break down the numbers. Students are paying about $15,000 for the project. To put that into perspective, that's roughly 50 cents per student. Sullivan that, says that's a small price sure to pay for a necessary project. And without the student portion? Well, it wouldn't have happened. And at the end of the day, you can't put a price on someone's safety. Something he hopes students will realize once the project is done. In Chapel Hill, I'm Patrick Wright, Carolina Week. South Campus has typically been where most freshmen live, and if university officials have their way, it will be all freshmen next year on South Campus. This is housing's effort to keep upperclassmen from moving off campus. More than 400 dorm rooms currently are vacant. Officials hope to push more than 200 additional freshmen to South Campus, opening up rooms for upperclassmen. Not everyone thinks it's such a good idea. Some members of the Residence Hall Association are worried the change might limit diversity. For the first time, UNC could be getting a campus-wide theme, H2O Carolina. The theme will be voted on by the Faculty Council in December. And if passed, the water theme would be worked into classes, plays, and even the freshman summer reading program. Still not clear what changes will be visible on campus, but if it's approved, the theme will last the next two years. We'll keep you updated. It's not surprising to see advertisements at football games or on Franklin Street, but some companies are bringing their campaigns to different sorts of places on campus. And not everyone is happy about it. Danielle Tepper has the story. When Alex DeGaulle goes to campus each day, she's not just going to class, she's also going to work. As an American Eagle brand enthusiast, Stigall's job is to promote the brand at UNC. Whether she's working an event or giving students a taste of the brand, she says the goal of her work is to help the company while also helping her peers. I want it to naturally enhance what they're doing, and I want to make it a positive impact on students' lives here, as well as for the American Eagle brand. Although advertising on campus is nothing new, American Eagle has taken an approach of marketing to students through students. Advertising professor John Sweeney says he sees nothing wrong with such techniques as long as they're transparent. If the students n knew that these were representatives of American Eagle who were helping them out, Students are sophisticated enough to know that American Eagle is not a philanthropic organization. But American Eagle isn't the only company interested in UNC students. Buses like this one transported crowds of first years to Target for a social event during the week of welcome in August. But some say restrictions on campus commercialization should be tighter. What I will say is in general, unrestricted commercialization kind of pollutes and cheapens the environment. Stigall, however, hopes her work will improve the campus environment. Obviously, American Eagle is like a brand from outside and is commercializing campus, but we're doing it in a way such that is benefiting campus. And she'll keep promoting the brand on campus for as long as the school allows. In Chapel Hill, I'm Danielle Tepper, Carolina Week. Digging into UNC's past will show you what archaeologists are finding here on campus. That story's next.
clean kitchen surfaces, utensils, and hands with soapy water. One in six Americans will get sick from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. If I had asked, if I try meth, will I become an addict? Or can you really lose it on meth? Or if I had asked, will meth become the only thing I care about? I wouldn't be asking. All right, can you load me up again? Have you noticed the big blue tarp by the financial aid office? You know, it's kind of hard to miss it. University archaeologists are digging around the Corkle place. It all started when contractors installing a water pipe noticed something unusual. And since then, these researchers have discovered all kinds of things, including artifacts dating all the way back to the start of the university. So what clues to the past have they found so far? Alana Austin gets to the bottom of this one. Shattered glass, rusty nails, and chips of pottery. This doesn't look like much, but archaeologists at UNC say these items date back to the first half of the 1800s. When contractors working on Vance Hall came across what looked like historic material, archaeologists got to work. I'm standing outside of the excavation site right now, and although most of us think of this building behind me as the financial aid office, it started out as somebody's home at the turn of the 18th century. After weeks of digging, researchers believe that this excavation site seen here used to be a cellar and drainage area for a house built in 1797. Head of the excavation, Dr. Steve Davis. As we excavate a little bit more, um, our ideas change about what it represents and the archaeological picture becomes clear. The home contained items like this plate, crafted by local potters hundreds of years ago. Other pieces, like this one, were imported from as far as England. So what was Chapel Hill like back in the day? The Chapel Hill that we see today bears only a very pale resemblance to what it has been during most of its history. The, the town folk regarded themselves as living in a village. Although Chapel Hill is no longer considered a sleepy southern town, Davis says there's one thing that hasn't changed. What we see initially is you know, some fragments of cow bones, but a lot of pig bone. So barbecue has a long history in the state. <laughs> Davis and the other archaeologists believe these artifacts will tell us more about the past. But first, they'll need some time to sort through the findings and run some lab work on the soil. Until then, these trinkets remain a hint to what Chapel Hill was like at another time. In Chapel Hill, I'm Alana Austin, Carolina Week. President Obama has nominated dean of UNC's has nominated the dean of UNC School of Public Health Barbara Reimer to the president's cancer panel. The three-member panel monitors the national cancer program and reports directly to the president. Reimer has been in Carolina since 2003 and is a member of the Lineberger Cancer Center. With exams right around the corner, it's time to start planning for where you'll study and when exactly you can study there. Davis Library will be open until 2 a.m. for each exam day. The undergraduate library won't ever close during exams except for 11 hours from December 10th at midnight until 11 that morning. And even though the first exam day is more than a week away, libraries are already filling up. For a link to changes in library hours, visit carolinaweek.org. A computer glitch hit UNC students trying to sign up for tonight's basketball game. When students went to TarHillBlue.com to register for the men's basketball game versus Wisconsin, more than 70 were charged a $7 processing fee. That's a mistake. Tickets are free of charge for students. Those charged have been refunded. The Human Rights Center, located in Abbey Court community of Carborough, is being asked to move by the end of this week. The center offers more than 20 programs, including after-school tutoring, language programs, and computer literacy classes. It also gives UNC students an opportunity to gain service experience in the community. Officials with the realty company that owns the apartment complex say the center operates as a business and public office. Officials with the center say they have a permit from the town and aren't selling anything or violating any rules. Students and supporters are trying to collect 5,000 signatures on a petition. The reason for the petition is to push back the move to May of next year so the center will have time to find a new location. They've been making national news now for the past couple of months in cities around the nation. But what have the members of, Occupy, of the Occupy movement been up to in Chapel Hill? They're still here, and they say they're going strong. They've been camping out in tents outside the old post office for the past couple of months. And despite the cold weather, they plan to continue. 
Unless they get kicked out, Occupy Chapel Hill members say they're not leaving anytime soon. Over the years, Top of the Hill, located right smack in the middle of downtown Chapel Hill, has become a landmark. There's the food, the drinks, and all that, but a lot of people know it for its microbrewery. You may know the place as Topo, but soon you may know the name Topo for other reasons. Sydney Holt has the story. Scott Maitland is the man behind one of Chapel Hill's hottest social spots. <laughs> Top of the Hill. But more than a restaurant and bar, Maitland also helped to lay the foundation for a local beer industry when he opened one of the region's first brew pubs, or microbreweries, there almost 20 years ago. I got inspired to do something about that and, and be, you know, became aware of a, you know, the brew pub concept and, and decided I could start something better than a TGI Fridays. And so, uh, basically, we did it just because I love downtown Chapel Hill. And Maitland isn't finished. Down West Franklin Street in the former Chapel Hill News Building, rather than beer, he'll be making vodka. According to the State Alcohol Beverage Control Annual Report, if North Carolina's distilleries see the strong popularity experienced by the state's craft brewers and local wineries in recent years, ABC stores across the state will need to get some additional space ready on the North Carolina shelf. North Carolina ABC Public Affairs Director Agnes Stevens agrees. We've got four active distilleries and we would anticipate that we would see increasing interest in, in the craft distillery market. Although not much is going on now, once the distillery gets its permit, this machine will produce about 10,000 cases of vodka per year, filling about 60,000 of these bottles. From distilling to dining, Maitland says that contribution to the local community is a large part of Top of the Hill's mission. In Chapel Hill, I'm Sydney Holt, Carolina Week. The distillery is still waiting for permits, but Topo hopes to start distilling by Christmas. Well, Preston, it finally feels a little bit like fall out there, sure wouldn't you does. agree? Yeah. Uh, but will, content will temperatures continue to drop? We'll have that in weather next. The 9-11 memorial is for my 343 brothers who didn't make it. And for my brother. This shows the world that we can rebuild. And that we are strong. It's for the heroes like my dad. This year, the National September 11th Memorial opens in New York City. Join us to honor, remember, and reunite. To learn more or to reserve your visit, go to 911memorial.org. Glad you can make it. The only triple doubles you get come with fries. Last time you blocked someone, you were online. I can do this all day. Your moves are just gay. <laughs> Using gay to mean dumb or stupid, not cool. Not cool. Not in my house, not anywhere. It's not creative, it's offensive to gay people. And you're better than that. All right, welcome back to Carolina Week, everyone. I'm Drew Day. Thank you so much for staying with us. As we take a look at your weather headlines, we'll be getting a, or taking a slow warm up here over the next several days. 53 was our high today out there this afternoon, but we'll be returning to the 60s in the coming days. And our next chance of rain will come late Monday evening into early Tuesday morning. We'll talk all about that throughout the forecast. As we take a look at some rainfall amounts for the past 24 hours, we had a little bit of rain that moved through the area yesterday. But as you can see from the amounts here in Chapel Hill, only three hundredths of an inch, only a hundredth in Fayetteville and not even any rain in Goldsboro. So there was just a few light showers out there, but it certainly didn't amount to a whole lot. 
As we take a look at the satellite picture across the area, you can see we had a little bit of cloud cover that moved in from the north throughout the day today, but it was some broken cloud cover, and so the sunshine was definitely able to come through. As we back out now and take a look at the nationwide view, you can see that just off to the west here, back out in the Plain States, there's no cloud cover out here, and that's because we had this high pressure system off to the west, and that's what's going to be our big weather maker here for the next several days. Here it is on the surface map. This is a current analysis of what's going on. This high High pressure system is sitting over Louisiana and into Texas and right now we've got some cooler air coming down in from the north and so that's why we were in the 50s throughout the day today but as we head into tomorrow you can see this high pressure system will shift to the east and be centered uh, mostly across the state and into Tennessee as well as will be a broad area of high pressure and what that will do is that will help to clear out all the cloud cover so throughout the day tomorrow we expect sunny skies wall-to-wall -wall sunshine and the same thing for Friday as well as we take a look at that map you can see that this high pressure stays with us with the sun continuing across the area. You also see this cold front just off to the west, but it will not get here until Monday and into Tuesday as well. So that's when our next chance of rain will be. So overnight tonight, expect temperatures to be in the lower 30s across the region. A cold evening out there. We'll have a little bit of wind out there, so there will be a wind chill effect. We expect temperatures to actually feel like 26 or 27 degrees this evening, so make sure you have a jacket. Partly cloudy tomorrow morning, but a chilly day with highs only in the mid 50s and breaking tomorrow down just a little bit further so that you know what to expect throughout the day. By 8 a.m. as you're heading off to work or school, 33 degrees with sunny skies. A little bit of cloud cover builds in by noon with 51, but then we clear out again in the evening with 41 by 8 p.m. And as we take a look at the seven day forecast now, you can see, or excuse me, five day forecast. We expect to see temperatures returning to the low 60s with 61 Friday sunny skies throughout the weekend. We might even be in the mid 60s for Monday with 65. So still not looking too bad, is it? Yes, we're definitely a little bit warmer than we should be this time of year, so it should be great. Thank you so much, Drew. All right, you're welcome. Well, coming up in sports, we'll get you geared up for the basketball team's top 10 matchup tonight with Wisconsin. Closer to nature can get you closer to your family. Go to discovertheforest.org. When some people struggle with their mortgage payments, they become frozen, petrified, not knowing what to do, they do nothing. But the people who take action are far more likely to get the most positive outcome. Making Home Affordable is a free government program. Call now to talk one-on-one -on -one with a housing expert about the options that are right for you. Real help, real answers, right now. Welcome back to Carolina Week. I'm Andy Reeves. After being knocked from atop the AP rankings last week by UNLV, the men's basketball team is hoping that what happened in Vegas stays in Vegas. Tonight they face number seven, Wisconsin. The Heels started the season strong and are hoping to get back to doing simple things like rebounding. Here's Henson with a nice rebound and put back and playing disciplined basketball. The Heels need to hold Wisconsin to one shot per possession and take high percentage shots to beat the Badgers. They can do that with plays like this fast break dunk by Tyler Zeller. But Coach Williams says he's afraid of this matchup for several reasons. They guard you, they score, uh, they shoot the Dickens out of it. They don't let you have second shots. They don't turn the basketball over. That game tips off at 9.30. Switching sports to football, one former Tar Heel could make Carolina history this weekend if he starts his first NFL game. You remember when T.J. Yates was in Carolina blue, but now he's sporting the red, white, and blue. 
for the Houston Texans. Last weekend, he played in his first ever game, notching 70 yards and a 53% completion rate. And this weekend, he is expected to start becoming the first Tar Heel QB ever to do that in the NFL. He holds a ton of passing records here at Carolina, and if he does get the start, he'll set perhaps the most significant mark of all. More good news out of football. Six Tar Heels were named to all ACC teams. Senior linebacker Zach Brown, senior defensive end Quentin Copels, and freshman tailback Giovanni Bernard were all named to the first team all ACC. There's Gio with a nice touchdown run. Bernard is the first UNC freshman to be named to the first team since Dre Bly in 96, and it's well deserved. Lineman James Hurst and Jonathan Cooper and wide receiver Dwight Jones, who you see with the touchdown right there, were named to the second team. As UNC's football season draws to a close, the focus is now on the penalties the program will receive for its NCAA violations. Self-imposed sanctions were a good start, but is there a way UNC could soften the blow even more and save money doing it? You would think a team with six All-ACC selections, including first-teamers Giovanni Bernard, who you see with the touchdown, and Zach Brown, there he is with the pick, would have more than three conference wins. The fact that they have a winning record, that they're bowl eligible, that they had to fight through all of the off-the-field distractions, they, they did a pretty good job, but there was still enough talent on that field where they could have finished much better than what they did. But this team did qualify for a bowl despite NCAA investigations hanging over them all season. With a 7-5 and five record, ESPN projects Carolina to go to the Independence Bowl where they would take on a Mountain West team. The question becomes, with penalties from the NCAA imminent, why not sit out what will be a lower tier bowl game that will only cost the school money to avoid a postseason ban in the future? If you could guarantee that it would lessen any kind of punishment by the NCAA, I would do it. I just don't think there's any guarantee. I don't really think a bull ban's coming because of how North Carolina has been proactive in dealing with the NCAA. A light punishment would be good news for the incoming coach. Everett Withers is likely out as UNC tries to wipe away the Butch Davis era, but what Davis and his former staff leave behind might be a big selling point for the Heels' next coach. To see the talent that was on the field, it's more attractive to potential coaching candidates. Saying, I'm going to be able to have a Highsmith, a Boyd, a Jones, a Renner on offense, that's pretty exciting. So maybe this job is a lot better than what some of the, the critics are going to say. For a team whose coach was fired nine days before the start of the season, 7-5 and five is a respectable finish. But with all the talent the Heels had on the field, fans are left wondering what might have been. Now, guys, there are some benefits to bowls, so it could hurt the heels to skip that game. All right, Andy, we've got a lot to look forward to. Thank you. Up next, we'll tell you where you can celebrate on the last day of classes. Coming up. If you have a story idea, call Carolina Week at 919-843-8292 or email us at carolinaweek at unc.edu. If you have questions about this program, write Carolina Week at Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina 27599. Be sure to check out Carolina Week and Carolina Connection online at carolinaweek.org. You realize that 49 million Americans struggle with hunger? That's one out of every six Americans. These people are around us every day. They're our friends, they're our coworkers, their kids go to school with our kids. Sometimes we're not even aware that they're struggling. This problem is closer than you think. But so is the solution. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Control us. It will never break us, define us, or keep us still. Because arthritis can't beat us if we beat it first. In the fight against arthritis, you need a weapon. What's yours? Visit the Arthritis Foundation at fightarthritispain.org. 
The last day of classes for the semester is almost here, and boy, am I ready. But you can celebrate at a concert this year, too. Hip-hop group Travis Porter will perform December 7th on campus in the Great Hall. Now, I hope you already got your tickets for the event because it has already sold out. There is another concert on campus that day, too, though, and it's free. So if you're interested in folk rock, you can check out Mandolin Orange with Mipso Trio. Definitely a lot to look forward to. Well, that does it for this edition of Carolina Week. Thanks for watching. Good night.